Okay, so you've had the intro to CVs. Now let's look at the classic CV. I don't mean a classic one-page CV. I mean the typical, somewhat boring, uh, predictable, but reliable way of putting a CV together. So what's the first thing on your CV? Well, it's not the word curriculum vitae or CV. It's your name. It's your name that should be up there in lights at the top. That actually serves a purpose. Do I need to be told it's a curriculum vitae? No, because it's damn well obvious it's a curriculum vitae. I do not need to be told that. Um, so save yourself the space. Your name goes on top. What about after your name? Well, that actually is a piece of English for you that perhaps you don't know. The letters after your name. They signify your qualifications. So, for example, if you have done a, uh, an English uh, degree, uh, you would be BA, Bachelor of Arts, BA, and, and possibly you went on to do a master's, but you did a master's in enumerate subjects, so it's a Master of Sciences, MSc. Put those qualifications up there. They mean something, especially in the international English-speaking market. Gradually, however, you will see those letters after your name um, either fade out or get much longer because after a few years, you're out in industry, a few people are actually going to be that bothered about the fact that uh, you got a degree seven and a half years ago. What they are going to be interested in is what you're doing now. What do I mean by that? Well. Not necessarily another qualification, but you may be a member of a professional association. In fact, you should be. Uh, you could be even now finishing your degrees or masters. If you consider yourself a young professional, look for a professional organization that represents the field that you want to go into. Now, you can look at that two ways. You can look at it in terms of business function. I'm going into marketing. So perhaps the Chartered Institute of Marketing started off in the UK, but is now Europe and global wide and very much respected. CIM goes after your name, MCIM, member of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. That says something. It's only the creme de la creme. It's only people who are thinking about their future and learning in the future and wanting to develop a network who can be bothered to become a paying, perhaps cost you a couple of hundred quid, a paying member of an association. But it's worthwhile and it speaks volumes. Imagine, you're at an interview, you're getting towards the end of the interview and somebody said, yeah, it's, you know, we, we're very interested in your candidature. Just out of interest, are you a member of any professional association in the marketing field? And you go, no, what's a professional association? You're dead, you've just shot yourself in the foot. So letters after your name mean something, and I will be doing another video on what professional associations are before long, probably later today. Okay, so at the top, your name with the letters after your name and hopefully a professional association membership as well. Then what? Well, of course, you've got to have your uh, personal details in the sense of um, your address that you want them to write to, your email address. If you've got a website you want them to look at or a Facebook page, etc., you've got to be able to get that information all up there. But please do remember a number of things. You are in France. You are in a corner of France that was German on any number of occasions for years gone by for a very long time. So a lot of the names are German. If you put uh, Hartmann's Villekopf uh, as your address uh, with that uh, mouth load of German, if you don't put France, People are going to be writing to you from America or from the UK, assuming it's Germany or maybe Austria, possibly Switzerland. They don't really know. So please, please, please remember to put the country. In addition, when it comes to your phone numbers, please put 0033 if you are French and have a French phone number. Some people don't know what the international dialing codes are. Don't make them look them up. Don't put plus plus because some people don't know what that means. And as one person actually said to me, he was confused by that at the time, um, they say plus plus, but I haven't got a plus on my phone. 
Um, what do I do? I said, the plus plus means zero, zero, madam. And she said, if plus plus means zero, zero, why don't they just say zero, zero? So please make the employer's life easy. Make sure you give him the full contact details. What do you do with the zero of your zero cease or zero set number? You put it in brackets. Why in brackets? So you get zero, zero, three, three, bracket, zero, bracket, six, seven, whatever. Because what that signifies to the rest of the entire planet is that if you are outside this country, you drop the zero. If you are inside the country, you drop the 0033 and you put the first zero back in. So please be very, very careful about that. Email addresses. Please have a professional email address that is as close to your name as you can get, preferably without a lot of numbers because spammers use numbers in the spam addresses that they generate. And a lot of email clients don't like them and dump them straight in the spam folder and the recipient, intended recipient, never actually receives them at all. So please, 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 something close to your name, but without a lot of numbers. Um, I had a student a couple of years ago who had an email address, which was Cuddly Kitter in Soissant Neuf, our hotmail. Um, avoid those type of things. It either says it's a spoof, it's sex mail, or it's somebody who's not serious. In either case, just don't do it. Okay, what other type of information do you need to put, which is personal information, on your CV? Well, the first thing to say about it is, it's your CV. You're not using necessarily a template or something from the company that forces you to give them that information. If there is information you want to give, fine. If there's information you don't want to give, fine. It's your CV and it's up to them to ask. If you don't want to put your age on because you're very young, you've had a hell of an experience, you've got a lot to offer, but if you put down age 22, the company might think, oh, too young, can't possibly have the experience. But if you leave off your age, maybe they'll be interested and invite you and be surprised that someone so young can have such a wide ranging and in-depth uh, experience to their name. Likewise, if you're me, you might not want to put approaching 62 on there because they think most people approaching 62 are dead as far as the opportunity for work and careers are concerned. Other things, marital status, single, married, in a relationship, does that concern an employer? No, it doesn't, but it can send some signals. If you put, for example, you're young, but you're married, it's going to be difficult to send you to the other side of the world um, uh, to replace a, a manager and move you around. If you're putting single, that suggests that we can move you around a bit, you are mobile, you are more available, you have fewer commitments, etc., and that might be attractive to an employer. Nationality, here's another one. Do you have to put down that you just happen to be Armenian? You don't. On your CV, you can leave that off if you wanted to. Do you have to put, if you have recently become naturalized French, do you have to put dual nationality Armenian French or naturalized French six months ago? No, you can put down whatever you feel that you want. Later on in your career, it may actually be interesting and profitable for you to actually put, put down married with children. Why? Because if you're inviting other people of your age to a meeting and they're bringing their partners, you have a partner, you have kids, they have kids. Actually, at your stage of life at that point, it may be a positive advantage to have people who are in a typical settle down situation. Do you have to put age? No. Do you have to put nationality? No. Um, so it really is up to you about how you do this. Driving license, putting that up there, that you have a full, clean driving license um, would be good. So if you've got that information at the top, what then? Well, if you are at university and you are just about to leave, your next section is probably going to be about uh, about your educational career. Now, remember, they are going to want to appoint you to a job 
because of the things that you are capable of doing, not because of the books you have read. So just putting down marketing, uh, communications management, search engine optimization, or whatever it happens to be, that actually doesn't tell them a lot. Um, for example, uh, with those, could you negotiate with a printer to produce 250,000 four-color brochures and come up with the best price? Search engine optimization, does that mean you can run a website as well? They don't know from those titles. There are lists of things that you turned up for on Monday morning at nine o'clock. That doesn't help them. What they are after is the skills and the knowledge bases that you have and that you can prove that you have successfully used and could transfer to their context. So please, yes, we need the dates. Yes, we need the course titles in French and in English. Yes, we need some indication of the content, but beyond that, we need to know about what the skills are that you have developed throughout this, that you are able to employ for the company, and that those things meet what the company is actually looking for. Okay, same thing goes, f oh, by the way, sorry, before I go any further, reverse chronology. In other words, the latest thing first. So I do not want to see brevet, baccalaureate, diploma, uh, degree, masters. Start with the biggest, most important, the, the highest level, the most impressive, which is likely to be the most relevant for the post that you're going for. So please, please, please reverse chronology. Same goes, by the way, for work. Put the most recent things in first. It's likely to be your placement, your stage. Okay, so put those in and again, detail not just who you worked for, but the skills that you developed and you refined, the projects that you worked upon, a major success that you had. That's what they're interested in, not just a date and a name. Oh, while we're on durations of things, I would, if I were you, put months, not days of the month. So for example, placement from January to June. If it was January the 31st to June the 1st, you basically lost two months off that. But if you say January to June, people are gonna go January, February, March, April, May, June, that's six months. In reality, it was nearer four months, but you're putting down six. You're not lying. If they want to know the precise dates, they can ask and you will tell them. And you're not lying because you did start in January and you did finish in June. So please, please, please think about that because where employers are looking for six months or a year, it's difficult to get those things to add up. But if you can stretch things by not lying, but actually just giving month to month, when they do the calculation on their fingers, it may actually look better for you, okay? So again, employment, what they're interested in is the knowledge, yes, and the skills that you've developed, employed, what you've learned, how you've refined those skills, and whatever it is that you're doing, that they can then use in their companies, or you can use to their advantage in the company that you hope to go to work for. Don't forget about the petit boulot. The little job, I call this super u okay. okay? Imagine, somebody's come to you, you're behind the okay, they're walking to you with two bottles and they're angry. What do you do? Well, the first thing is, you calm them down, you lighten things. Um, sir, I think you've got a, an issue to do with those two bottles, it seems to me. Would you like, perhaps, and you smile at them, would you like to explain to me what the issue is? And let me see what I can do for you to put the situation right. In other words, that's creating an atmosphere. It's calming things down. Then what do you do? The client speaks. What do you do? You listen. While you're listening, you're processing to try and understand the problem and understand the root cause of the problem. So while you are listening, you are beginning to come up with possibilities. 
So then you speak and you say, if I've understood correctly, sir, this is clarification, this is the situation. And I think we have a number of options which we can put forward, which will help satisfy you. Option one, option two, option three. Um, which would you prefer? Which would you like me to do for you? And then you listen again. And between the two of you, you are negotiating. So you negotiate. And then what you do, you put something into action. I could give you another version of that that involves millions of pounds for a massive company between the PDG and his number two. Actually, it's exactly the same process that you use behind Super U Akei. It's just that the figures are bigger. So remember, even small jobs matter. While we're on that, voluntary work. That's even more important in some respects. A CV tends to give a list of stuff that you did, places you went, the time you spent doing X, Y, Z. Doesn't tell you much about you, the person, what you like, what you think, what you believe. Voluntary work does. Voluntary work says there is more to life than paid employment. I believe in certain things and I'm prepared to give up my time, some possible income, etc., to help in these particular situations. Even if it's only a week and the rest of to occur um, once a year near Christmas, if you've had the time. Those things speak volumes about not what you do, but about who you are. When somebody employs you, they're employing you, all that you are, the person that you are. So showing some of that on your CV is vital. So please talk about voluntary work, not just the dates, but why you do it, what you hope to achieve, what, what you believe about it, okay? There's nothing wrong about saying, I believe that it's the duty of citizens to be able to help even at their own cost of time and money because there are others less fortunate. Da -da. And the context of that, I work for Médecins Sans Frontières. I worked as a translator in a refugee camp, as one of my students has done. So that says an awful lot about you. So please, please, please don't forget that. Okay, what comes after that? Well, you've got a whole load of different types of skills, some of which you'll have drawn out already, but skills come in different packages. There are technical skills that may be to do with languages and communication. For example, you may have a, a B2 in gym. Just remember, the CLES scheme is a European scheme. The English speaking nations don't really understand it. So if you have a, an English C2, and you're thinking, great, I'm as good as it gets. I'm as good as a native speaker. If you show C2 to somebody who doesn't understand it, they're gonna say, where's the grade A students? Where are my A students? We don't understand this system. So if you're dealing with languages, you have to give the level descriptor from the CLES homepage. There are two, one is one line long and the other is a paragraph long. Choose one, but put it up there so we understand what that means. Other technical skills, like, for example, um, new technologies, what it is that you use, etc. cetera. Um, and if you're saying, I use Illustrator, or I use Paint Shop Pro, are you a junior or, or are, do you really master this? Do you really have an ability to do and uh, to use these things? Have you produced websites using Dreamweaver or uh, WordPress or whatever it happens to be these days? If so, give evidence. Give links to the sort of things that you've done with it. Um, you need to prove what these skills are because those are the things that they really, really want to see. So please, the skills have to leap out. And if they happen to leap out in the order that they suggest they want to see them from the job description and person specification, then so much the better. What else have you got? Well, hobbies and sports, please do not just put down basketball. Please do not just put tennis. Uh, please do not put reading, films, it doesn't say anything. They need to know about you and what your interests are. If you're really passionate about something, normally you do something, you don't just spectate. 
So what is it that you do? If you're interested in reading, what genre of books um, have you been collecting these for years? If you are interested in cycling, do you compete? Do you vetete? What's been your, your, your biggest uh, trip on your, on, on your bike around the country, etc.? If like one student that I had, uh, Hakim, I remember you well, uh, you happen to be somebody who was in the French national basketball squad and you just put basket down on your CV. Uh, you really have to make these things work for you. Finally, references. What are these? You need to give somebody the name and address and the email of the course director and administrator for your course. Why? because people buy certificates online and could say very easily, I've got a MICAI certificate from the FSSG uh, at UHA and be lying because they've simply bought it online. You need to give the employer an opportunity to check up that you really did get awarded uh, your degree or your master's in uh, June 2011, or whatever it happens to be. So please, please, please do that. And if you can, give one other employment reference, someone who can say something nice about you. This person was always great, turned up on time, was dependable. You could trust them. They handled money, cash, etc. Uh, they were inspirational. They were always there to help customers. They always got on in teamwork. Um, they're very good leading a team. Someone who can say something nice about you. Because in the English speaking world, we have a habit of saying, thank you very much. You have the job subject to the taking up of references, which means you've got the job as long as these references say what you promised they would say. So there we go. That's essentially the shape of your CV. But the key things once again are that even if you're doing it in this classical framework, you have got to get the skills and the knowledge bases that the company says they want to leap out of the page and throttle them until they put you on the interview pile. Dun, 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 dun. Remember. OK, so there we go. That's the second part of the uh, CVs series. The third one is going to be on taking a non standard approach and will be that much shorter than this. Um, uh, this little piece to camera has. All right, there we go. And it goes without saying, as we're in the middle of a health crisis, I hope you and your family are safe and healthy. Okay. All right. See you. Bye.